Fiquem agora com o Fernando Moraes. Obrigado pela apresentação. Obrigado, Bárbara. É um prazer falar com vocês nessa tarde tão importante da jornada Mais Educação da SBS sobre um tema tão importante. Uh, you will notice that I'm speaking Portuguese and you might not understand what I'm saying. So, uh, initially this uh, talk was scheduled to be made in Portuguese, but then we realized there are many participants connected who may not speak Portuguese. And uh, that's why we're going to do something in which we're going to uh, switch uh, between languages, uh, Portuguese and English. Some of the slides are um, mostly, most of the slides are in English, but I was going to use them in Portuguese because we invited a broader audience who speaks uh, both languages. So if that's okay with you, we're going to uh, do a little bit of both, right? If you have any questions, please let me know, use the chat for that. So, um, but I'm going to do it mostly in English. And we're going to talk about originals. Educators who are originals, right? Uh, so to start with, I'm going to go through the agenda with you. So even though it's in Portuguese, let me go through it in English uh, with you. We're going to talk a little bit about um, Education 4.0 uh, and as well as the role of technology in this uh, scenario, especially after COVID-19 hit us all. Uh, and how we can stimulate uh, originality in our students uh, in this new context. Um, professions that will be in high demand in the future, in the next decade, and also what students think of their own education. But for us to get started, I would like to propose a poll for you guys. So this poll is going to be at uh, menti.com. So I'm going to ask you to, to go to the website, menti.com, code 2233, or scan, simply scan this uh, QR code here on screen. So please, I'm going to leave my screen so I can share the poll with you guys. So I hope you connect in there. All right, so let's go. Um, and here is the first question. This is where the answers are going to appear. So go to menti.com 282833 and then you are going to see it there, right? Uh, so you are going to use three words that come to your mind when you think of the education of the future or education in the future. Educação do futuro. What comes to your mind when you think of it? So please, insert your answers. You can type up until three words. I want to see what uh, is in your mind. The first idea that comes to your mind when you think of it. Right? So get your phone. Um, we're going to use this uh, tool a lot. We have the first response. Thank you so much. Let's see whatever uh, comes up. Thank you. No, but if challenging, long-term, inclusion. All right, so more words are coming. Thank you for your entries. Right, if you need to get your phones, all right. As you can see, some words start to get bigger and more central. All right, we can see there are some winners in there. Whoa, great. We can see Zoom, but... Thank you. As you can see, the platform changes according to your answers. We can see there seems to be a winner here, the idea of technology, technological, right? Uh, in Mentimeter.com, I like this, uh, this tool, Mentimeter, because then the words uh, more uh, in the central are the most frequent answers, and uh, they also get bigger. So you can see the technology online, collaboration, uh, challenging as well. Thank you. These are the most frequent ideas. 
it keeps changing and changing. And uh, I would like to have a look at it later with more time. Interaction is also another big idea. So it seems uh, to have moved quite a bit. It's starting to stop. 76 uh, entries. Well, thank you so much, guys, for your responses. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go back to the presentation now, as there are 80-something entries already. Uh, you can keep posting your answers if you want. Uh, but we're going to talk about Education 4.0 in the beginning. And uh, why is it 4.0? Um, there was a first industrial revolution, which was the 1.0 age, uh, said, put it this way, um, which was when the steam-based machines uh, came about. So uh, trains and factories were, were mostly powered by coal, and uh, the burning of this coal and, and the steam it produced uh, generated these machines. And this industrial revolution impacted life and changed society in many aspects. Uh, education 2.0, then, sorry, um, the second industrial revolution or society 2.0 was impacted by the arrival of electricity. And electricity also generated energy based um, factories and other uh, things, production means, and it allowed the mass production of um, uh, products, and that uh, affected hugely our, our society. And that happened uh, between the 19th and 20th uh, century with the arrival of electricity, but people still didn't know what to do very well with electricity in the beginning of the second industrial revol uh, revolution. Uh, they perfected it through time. And in our age, I mean, in my age at least, who's I'm probably older than most of you, uh, we had the third industrial revolution, which was uh, which took place in the late 20th century. I hope uh, most of you at least witnessed this uh, third revolution. Otherwise, I would feel really embarrassed and humiliated <laughs> for my age. But still, uh, this is the computer and internet-based uh, knowledge generation. When this technological uh, age changed the world and the world of education in so many ways. And finally, Society 4.0 or Industry 4.0 is uh, the industry of the fourth industrial revolution or the second information revolution. Uh, it took place, it started in the early 20th century, so I think both of us were uh, alive to see that. And it's the age of artificial intelligence and information technology. So um, these are the two big ideas, artificial intelligence softwares, and it's the age of the big data, the Internet of Things, cloud computing, and other things. But what are the implications of this to us, teachers, educators? Um, I think here you can see a little uh, bit of what happened in education. And there was Education 1.0, which was mostly teacher-fronted. Students were like a tabula rasa, in which uh, they had no knowledge at all. They were empty recipients uh, of knowledge, and teachers knew it all, would then uh, share knowledge with them. In the second stage of, in, of uh, education uh, revolution, which is called Education 2.0, learners uh, were still the receptacle of, uh, of, of knowledge, but there was interaction between students and teachers. Fernando, Fernando, desculpe interromper, o pessoal está pedindo para você afastar um pouquinho o microfone que está dando eco no áudio. Ok, ok, vamos ver se assim melhora. Parece que melhorou. Está melhor? Parece que melhorou. Vamos ver se assim melhora, tá bom? Desculpa, pessoal. Imagina, desculpa interromper. Imagina, não por isso, Bárbara. Depois me desconta esses dois minutos no final. É, tá tranquilo. <risos> Obrigada, Rafa. Obrigado você. Bom, Aliás, é Rafa difícil. não, Fernando. Desculpa. 
<laughs> Education 2.0, okay? There is interaction between students and teachers, right? Um, teachers would ask questions, students would respond. Um, but there is, there was another stage to that. And perhaps most of us in our institutions, uh, we're still living in, in that education 3.0, which is what? It's probably education based in uh, projects and inquiry, it's inquiry based learning. There is a lot of social network being used, um, access to the, to global expertise, which the internet allowed us, um, to have, right? and this idea of collaboration. So what the pandemic of COVID-19 intensified, accelerated, was education 4.0. And most of us have witnessed uh, some of this uh, recently, right? Regardless of the way we teach, we have uh, learners uh, connected and producing and sharing content most of the time. The web stopped being a resource, but it started being the medium of the classes, right? It's one thing to think of uh, the internet and the web as a resource for education, a source of, uh, uh, of Google searches, for example. Another thing is to think of the classroom that takes place on the web, right? This is, this is a different uh, mind, shift, mind shift. So, um, Learners uh, sometimes have to act as teachers in, in this uh, setting as they have uh, perhaps more familiarity with this uh, context. And uh, educators start being a resource guide. This is what we have for education 4.0 towards the future. And the pandemic uh, accelerated that. But I know we have a lot of English teachers here, right? And thinking of... Um, English teachers mostly, I took the liberty to um, thinking about how these uh, revolutions happen in English language teaching. So um, I, I was thinking about this in the beginning of the 20th century between the 1900s and the 1940s uh, is what I call English 1.0. English 1.0 was mostly behaviorist, structuralist, um, students would learn based on grammar and translation, sometimes stimulus and responses. Then English 2.0, uh, some of us have witnessed that happening and, and it lasted up until the mid 80s. And it was more cognitivist and more humanistic in which there was more interaction, right? Between uh, students and, and teachers and learners as well. English 3.0 uh, was the communicative approach that we all experienced. And many of us have probably gone through classrooms, if, whether as students or as teachers, which experienced English 3.0. Maybe some of our classes uh, are still education 3.0. We practice communicative language teaching, right? We, press, we practice the principle eclecticism, which means we don't use a single method. This is the post-era method, uh, post-method era, sorry. There is not a perfect method anymore. But um, we use the best uh, practices in all methods. So what is this education 4.0 then, this English 4.0 in our area? I am also an English teacher. So uh, tendencies or trends in English teaching in the future. Especially in Brazil, we now live a time of uh, pseudo bilingualism in which we, we, uh, we watch, we witness the multiplication of bilingual programs everywhere. Uh, pretty much anything can be called bilingual nowadays. Uh, basically, content-based instruction and CLIL approaches have been called bilingual education regardless of any other aspect um, of this instruction. There is also the phenomenon of uh, early biliteracy, uh, the idea that the earlier the better for, for kids to study. So if you as a teacher or as a school uh, used to offer classes as of, uh, let's say, seven years old when in the past, nowadays uh, you will find lots of teachers, uh, lots of parents looking for teachers 
for kids who are two, three, and sometimes we as publishers are faced with the challenges. Do you have material for one-year-olds, please? And then we go, okay, we have no materials for one-year-olds, but we have for two-year-olders. So uh, this is the idea that uh, the earlier, the better. This uh, learning is nowadays more inquiry-based, which means uh, a learning based on investigation in which students have to find their own answers. It's not... They are not only receptacles of, uh, in, of um, information given by teachers, but they will look for it. Um, social and emotional learning is another trend in education, the so-called so, so soft skills, full of augmented and virtual reality, and in which students make things with their own hands. It's the maker culture. Um, and also the advent of uh, programming or coding as another language for students learning. The so-called 21st, 21st, 21st century skills, right? We were, we are almost in the middle of the 21st century, but people still talk about 21st centuries. Actually, this might be an obsolete team, um, uh, at least um, obsolete word or term. And people are nowadays talking about soft skills, the um, skills that cannot be learned uh, or taught uh, directly only uh, through content, right? It's more than content. It's uh, learning how to deal with uh, one another, right? Learning how to be creative, how to be collaborative, and also learning empathy and resilience and things like that. This education is also powered not by steam like steam boats, but this other kind of steam. Um, some um, Courses will call it STEAM, others will call it STEM, right? But basically, it's the idea of science, technology, engineering, and math helping form uh, the innovators of the future, the scientists of the future will, who will have uh, their ideas and will help uh, discover the products and change the world in a way. And you can have arts uh, as the A of STEAM, um, depending on, on the version you talk. And this is... Uh, what students are doing in their own classrooms uh, and classes started uh, receiving all these <laughs> materials here that probably wouldn't be there in the past. But then you would think, well, but I'm an English teacher. Why do I have to know all that? Well, we're talking about changes and perhaps permanent changes in education. But uh, polling time number two, I would like to talk to you about ed tech tools now, right? So get your cell phone and get ready for the second part of that vote uh, I would like to, to have from you. First, you talked about the future of education, and this is what we found, right? We found technology in the center, interaction. We had 107 entries. But now I have a second question for you, okay? So go to menti.com and use the same code or just go to the next screen. So here... You have it. The second question is this. Which device contributes the most for learning in the classroom? Which device um, contributes the most or helps the most or potentializes learning the most in the classroom? So there are six here and you can put them in order. There are six uh, possibilities and one of them is none. If you think none of them helps, uh, you click on none. All right, so I'm going to give you some time for you to vote. Which of these devices uh, contributes most for uh, learning in the classroom? What do you think? Mm. Now it's open. Sorry, I had closed the polling. But now you can go. Now you feel free to vote. All right. We can see laptops there, the first answer. What else? What do you think? Right. And in this one, you can actually rearrange the information, the options. You can think of that. Let's see. We have nine entries so far. Laptops are winning. Interactive whiteboards are still there on the top. Let's see what you think. Live. I love this. This is, this is pretty cool. And uh, at this point, you might 
have a favorite. You might pick a winner <laughs> already, but let's see what happens in this race. Right. Um, some options there with laptop interactive whiteboard neck and neck, smartphone second. Let's see, what do you think? All right, 62, 65. All right, many people are are voting already. So while you vote, and I'm going to keep some suspense, it seems like smartphones have <laughs> taken over, right? They are much, they're way far ahead now. We have lots of votes uh, for smartphones now. Then laptops coming second, interactive whiteboards coming third. Uh, if you do not have a, a, a smartphone right now, well, you can vote later. I would appreciate to have your opinion on that. Well, thank you. So we're reaching 100 voters already, and it seems like smartphones lead, followed by laptops. Tablets are not that popular anymore, and interactive whiteboards are there as well. Okay, so as we reached uh, 100, I'm going to go back to the presentation. And uh, we have voted for this. And I would like to review some interesting results for you. All right. So um, we learned that in the United States, college students still prefer um, laptops for learning, o although tablets are on the rise, but college students. OK. And I think this has a lot to do with uh, students' age and where they are. So college students probably prefer laptops because it's easier for them to type. They um, are more mature. They can carry a sturdy equip a piece of equipment with them. But now if you look at the breakdown of devices by age group, you see that in elementary school, this purple line here is tablet. So tablet, the tablet is still the favorite device for elementary school aged kids, uh, six between six and ten, right? And it's still popular in middle school, but uh, we start to see laptops, notebooks, and Chromebooks take over. And in college, the difference is much, much um, higher. And nowadays, we're we witness a, a rise of tablets uh, in this. Uh, uh, older age group, but smartphones and tablets, uh, smartphones and notebooks, uh, sorry, and laptops, they are pretty close there. So the best answer would probably be depends on, on, on what age they are. But one thing we know for sure, if your school, if you're a school owner or a school teacher uh, like me, your school might have had in the past a computer lab like this with desktops, um, but nowadays, uh, at least in the school where I teach as well, uh, my uh, old computer lab became a maker space, right? So this maker space has flexible um, um, chairs and uh, desks that can be moved according to the activity the teacher wants to propose. Uh, there is a, a cart with uh, Chromebooks, which are brought to the classroom whenever necessary. There is an interactive whiteboard as well. So they became multi-purpose uh, spaces. Um, so computer labs are becoming maker spaces. Actually, this is what the most revolutionary maker spaces look like. I also like visiting a, a school dear to my heart in Brasilia, where there is a, a great maker space there, which looks like this, uh, very futuristic. So. Um, Computer labs are becoming workshops, right? They are becoming oficinas, where students will work with their hands and produce uh, things uh, uh, by their hands. And we still have, yeah, tablets. You can see Kahoot there. You, you're probably familiar with this uh, app. Uh, if we have time, we're going to use it. But the favorite device for youth is, um, for the younger ones, is still the tablet because nothing is as precise as the touch of their hands. Right, and the screen is bigger than a smartphone. Little kids may not have a smartphone, but uh, schools can provide them with a tablet. But for the older ones, then smartphones are still favorite. You still have a big tube TV there in the back, but uh, smartphones are probably the favorite device for this older generation towards uh, middle and high school. Polling time. Since we're talking about smartphones, 
let's go back to menti.com and I would like to have your uh, saying in this third question related to the use of smartphones in the classroom, right? Voting is now open and I would like you to vote. Um, I want you to tell me if you strongly disagree and if you, or if you strongly agree with each of these uh, statements, all right? Where do you stand in this line? That is regarding the use of cell phones in class. So sorry for those who don't speak Portuguese. First statement says cell phones should be banned. Second says cell phones should be used sporadically uh, from time to time. Schools do not have structure for the use of cell phones. And the last one, teachers should use the cell phone in class uh, frequently. So what do you think? I'd like to have your vote. Okay, so 16 people have voted. Want to have your opinions on that? Seems like a uh, few people say that cell phones should be banned. Um, the one with the majority of uh, answers is that teachers should use the phone frequently, the higher grade here, right? More than half of the people think that schools do not have uh, infrastructure that allows the use of cell phones, right? So we're already getting to 70 voters, right? So the ideas are pretty close, but still the biggest one, the highest uh, um, in number of voters is that teachers should use the cell phone frequently. Right, that's good to know. Uh, all right, so as we are getting to the 100th uh, person voting, <laughs> we're going to move on, right? Uh, yeah, so the conclusion for our group here is that uh, teachers should use the cell phone frequently in class. Majority, the majority of people think about that. Uh, a small portion of people think that cell phones should be banned. So only... Uh, a few people think that. So thank you very much for your opinions. Um, well, if you want to see what happened in the previous poll uh, about the favorite device, I'm going to go back so you can see the winner. <laughs> we have 114 voters. And the device that contributes the most to learning was considered the smartphone, with laptops coming second and interactive whiteboards coming third. Tablets and desktops were much uh, under their, uh, their number of votes. So smartphones, laptops, interactive whiteboards, thank you. And 107 people voted for this one. Well, thank you so much for your opinions, guys. It's so important to hear from you. I didn't want only to share my, my thoughts. I wanted to hear from you as well. But it, it seems like they kind of... Uh, um, complement each other. They, they go uh, together a lot. Well, now I'd like to move on to the part where we're going to talk about skills for 2030. Uh, and why 2030? Because that's exactly 10 years from now, 10 years post pandemic of COVID-19. Um, but that's not why we, we carried out this research. This is a research carried out by Pearson called the future of skills, employment in 2030. Uh, this was a, a piece of research carried out by the NASTA um, in the UK, the Institute, as well as the Oxford Martin University. And it's a very reliable one. It's a comprehensive study. You can find it in the future of skills.pearson.com, uh, in which we, we asked professionals and we did lots of research. Uh, to find out the professions that would be um, in higher demand in the future. We also studied uh, the trends for the future and we found seven trends that will um, affect employment in 2030. And just one more thing about 2030, about this, this number. 2030 is probably, if you teach teenagers nowadays, as I do, if your students are between 11 and I don't know, maybe 11, 10, and 15, 2030 
or in 10 years time is probably when your students will have graduated and when they will hit the job market, right? When they are 22, 23, when they will have gone through their first job already and they will be looking for more serious uh, and more uh, certain employment opportunities. So these are some of the aspects that will influence their lives, the future of skills. And we found out uh, there is a piece of research which you can take. I think it's very interesting. You can explore the whole research and, and read the whole paper from the Oxford Martin School. Or you can just explore the landscape. And thinking about the demand for professionals in 2030, uh, this study was carried out both in the US and in the UK. And look at that, in the United States of America, if you are a teacher nowadays, sometimes we wonder about the profession of the future. We think it's something related to technology. Is the computer designer of uh, rockets that fly to Mars? And we think that these are the professionals of the future, the person who will write the code to autonomous cars that will shop for us in the supermarket. Actually, no. Professionals with the higher de highest demand in 2030 in the United States are preschool, primary, secondary, and special education teachers. Just so you understand this uh, data, um, there is a 97.8% chance that demand will increase more than 70% in the future. That's what it means. 100%, we are 100% sure, or the Oxford Martin University is, uh, school is, that 100% sure that education uh, in, in these jobs will increase more than 50% in demand. Nowadays, there are 4 million professionals in the US, so we predict that this number will increase more than 70%, right? So there will be a lot of jobs for you guys if you are in education in the United States. See, animal care comes right second after that, right? Uh, followed by uh, service workers. But if you are an educator, that's very good news. Well, you might be thinking that the UK is very different from that, right? So two, um, just again, two out of the first, uh, the top five jobs here are related to education. Preschool, primary uh, teachers and post-secondary teachers as well coming in fourth. In the UK, things are not very different. Um, teaching and educational professions coming second and um, food preparation, hospitality trades are the first, but uh, there is a lot, there are a lot more teaching and educational professionals nowadays. So there are more uh, vacancies, more, more job openings in that area in the future for sure. Right. So good news for us who are teachers, because I'm quite sure the same thing would uh, a similar thing would happen in Brazil in terms of demand for professionals. I'm not saying they're going to earn the highest salaries, but there will, there will be a highest demand for professionals. Right. Um, in terms of skills, the most important skills uh, for the future, we found out that learning studies was the number one in the U.S. And I highlighted originality here in number eight, because this is the topic of uh, today's uh, talk, right? We're talking about originality, about educators who are originals, and we're getting to that soon. But that's where I got the, the title for this, uh, this uh, workshop, because originality is the one that appears uh, and it's, it's important in both, uh, for both in the US and the UK as a skill. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Sometimes um, as a teacher, uh, you may think, well, my job is not doing well enough. I think I would like to, to change jobs. I want to change areas. And I thought, well, what would happen if I went to another area? Okay, I'm going to see what would happen um, in the future for me in terms of skills. What do I have to learn? So in this report, you can try for yourselves. And I entered my information there. Fernando, uh, if I were in the US, and if I were an English language and literature teacher or post-secondary teacher, in 2030, I'll be 48 years old. So you can do the math and see how old I am. Uh, 
and uh, skills that would help me the most to prepare for the world for my job in 2030 are learning strategies, instructing, and active listening. I have to listen to my students, right, in the classroom. So that reveals a lot. The teacher is not only the speaker, but it's the listening now, the listener now. And my job has a 77.4% of chance of growth by 2030. Very optimistic, right? Whereas if I take a look in, in here, you can take a look and you can try it by yourselves, right? Uh, by scanning the, um, the code or trying the, the link in here, right? Uh, I thought about, well, okay, maybe I'll try computer programming. I'm not happy as a teacher anymore. Well, if I decide to make a, a career change and I want to go into computer programming, uh, these are the skills I need to learn learning strategies, fluency of ideas, and technology design. These are the most important skills. But computer programmers' job have a 44.4% of chance of growth by 2030 in comparison to what we have today. So uh, teachers will, will probably be in higher demand, but there is still... Uh, a chance of increasing, and there will be an increasing demand to uh, computer programmers as well. And you can try this later. I hope you like it. I enjoyed doing this a lot. So how can we stimulate originality in the classroom? And I want to share a little bit of what I learned about originality um, from reading this book. And I'm saying reading, I should be saying listening because um, I love audiobooks. Um, I'm a subscriber to audible.com. And uh, there I found uh, Adam Grant's uh, originals, um, How the Nonconformists Move the World. And Adam Grant talks about, he is a professor in the Wharton School in Pennsylvania, in the, in the MBA of Wharton, one of the most reputable uh, MBAs in the world. And he has lots of students, so he's a teacher like us, and he teaches a little bit about originality in this book. And the first characteristic that original people have is that they have lots of bad ideas. And you must be thinking, what? Having a lot of bad ideas, how can that help me be original? Well, it turns out that this is from his Twitter account. When it comes to an idea to idea generation, quantity is the most predictable path to quality. So what Adam Grant is saying is that if you want to raise a generation of innovators, of originals, or if you want to be an original teacher, you need to be, you need to have lots of ideas. Quantity is more important than quality in terms of ideas. If, you are, if you're waiting for the perfect idea to put into practice and make a lot of success, you're probably wrong right? You should try lots of ideas. Go run, uh, take risks. Don't worry. Go ahead and try. Uh, if, if it doesn't work, uh, I love what, what someone close to me says, fail fast, right? The fail fast strategy. I'm going to put something in practice right away. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to fail fast and change my course. And that'll probably help me. In these days of pandemic and online teaching, right? If you are... Um, you're afraid of trying a new platform because you don't know if it's going to work. You're afraid of using your cell phone because you don't know if it's going to work. You're afraid to appear in the camera because your hair is messy. Um, fail fast. Just go. If it doesn't work, you change. So that's what Originals and Adam Grant spent a whole piece of his life, his uh, academic life, studying people who were originals, who came up with uh, good ideas. Second thing. And there is a TED talk uh, where he talks about the second of these um, ideas. Uh, original people are late to the party. Oh, what does that mean? It means that perhaps you think you are behind that. Perhaps you think, oh, no, I'm too old for that. I can't do this thing of online teaching. I'm going to wait for this whole thing uh, to pass so I can uh, start teaching face to face again. No problem if you had this kind of thinking, but go ahead and try, right? Uh, try to start. 
uh, even if you were late to the party, there is no problem because original people are usually late to the party. That means that they may not act right away. Sometimes they wait to see how the market will move. If you think, for example, Uber is the first company in, in its uh, segment, it is not, right? Uh, Lyft uh, appeared first in the United States and Uber came second and later to become the first uh, company in, in its uh, segment. So um, you don't have to be the first. You can do something that perhaps uh, was done before. So being original is different. It, it, being original is not the same thing as being only creative. You don't have to create things uh, that don't exist yet. Perhaps you can adapt things that exist and make them work in a different way so that you get better results. He also mentions the concept of strategic procrastination in which there is an, an ideal moment for you to start doing things. If you start doing things right away and if, they, if you do things really fast, you may not mature uh, as, good as, as well as possible your ideas. Uh, the Mona Lisa, for example, it took 17 years for Leonardo da Vinci to paint Mona Lisa. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the Mona Lisa was finished actually two uh, weeks before uh, Leonardo da Vinci died, when he was much older. And on the other hand, he had accumulated a lot of knowledge from his other experiences. So pieces of art may take a lot longer to, to happen. You may not be familiar with the Mac Black Lives Matter movement now, uh, that Martin Luther King prepared his favorite, uh, his most famous speech of I Have a Dream the night before he delivered the speech. So uh, that's okay if you, there is an, a, a, a value in accumulating experience so you can do what you want to do. So if you're late to the party, you think it's too late, don't think so. Right, Alfred Hitchcock recorded, filmed his, his best movies when he was close to, fi to 60 years old, right? So there is still a lot of time for us to do. Don't, don't think it's too late. And the, the second, the third uh, characteristic is that original people are afraid to fail. And perhaps you're thinking, oh, I, I'm too scared to try this. No problem. Original people are afraid to fail. Uh, the founders of uh, Google, for example, they remained in their doctorate uh, degree up until um, they, Google was very successful. They did not abandon the university to found uh, Google because they were afraid to fail. And Adam Grant gives lots of examples from his old students. So no problem. If you're afraid to fail, if you feel you are late to the party, and if you, if you don't have many ideas, uh, you can change that. Don't worry. Just uh, Try to do your best, right? And you can do that. And I would like to conclude by uh, sharing with you what students are thinking about this uh, troublesome uh, times. Another piece of research we conducted at Pearson, the Global Learner Survey, which was published in uh, September 2019. You can find this. It's free, okay? It's not a book we're selling. It's online on Pearson's website. It says, uh, from, from the learner's per perspective, and I'm going to share some things really quick here to say that people are moving beyond traditional learning. So if you have a language school, uh, perhaps you should not uh, only consider that uh, the other school is your competitor, right? You might have um, uh, Duolingo as a competitor or Open English as a competitor, right? People who um, are platforms in which uh, students learn by themselves. So it's not traditional learning anymore. Um, in some countries, traditional formal education is still reigning supreme, um, right? This is uh, the, the green bar is the percentage that says that, says that uh, the time you need a formal education to achieve a, a good job. But this is changing as well, right? Um, people are thinking beyond traditional degrees. And this is interesting because Brazil, China, and the Middle East, Brazil has the second, Brazil is the second country where people uh, think an, a college degree is the most important. In other places like in the UK or Australia or even in the US, people don't see a college degree as the most important thing for their future yet. There is no 40 year career anymore. It's, a, it's an era, it's an era of reinvention. 
students are thinking of learning other skills uh, in their future. People are not retiring from life anymore. People are retiring in life and they are learning other skills when they um, retire. So again, another tip of originality, learn a new skill, learn to do something else. If you want to make a career move or uh, even in the, in the area of, uh, of English language teaching, if you want to learn something else, you are not yet a bilingual teacher. Okay, right, learn about bilingualism. You want to learn and prepare students for exams. Go and learn how to prepare students for exams. And uh, find other things you can learn. Um, human skills are very important. Uh, we think about virtual reality and we think this will be the, the only important skill in the future. But human skills are very important. Um, this is the percentage of workers that consider soft skills as important as STEM skills in the future. 78% of them think of that. Human skill will be more important in the future. The numbers are high as well. Self-service learning, guys, this will increase in the future. So people will start learning things by themselves. And finally, I would like to move on. Well, this thing of learning languages is more something I would ask you uh, like verbally like this, but there is no interaction in this talk. So um, if someone asks you what's the language to learn in the future, you would probably say, Chinese, but the survey shows that English is still the number one language in the world for learning for the future. Uh, second, in second comes coding. Learning coding is probably more important than learning Chinese and Spanish comes forth, right? So um, again, this shows coding as the new second language of the future, right? Uh, digital and virtual learning will increase in the future smart devices and virtual learning will will outtake uh, print textbooks in the future um, and i would like to finish with a little bit of quiz time we're going to play a little kahoot in a few minutes i yes I, I, I asked barbara if i could take these two minutes and she said that's no problem since we had that little problem in the beginning so let's play a little bit of kahoot uh together here uh you probably knows you probably know how it works already so I wanted to join this Kahoot for us to go out with a bang. So you got to go to Kahoot.it. Or if you have the app, you just insert this quote. This code 364473. I'm going to wait for you to enter, to some of you to join us uh, so that we can start. And uh, I'm sure you can be pretty fast in that. You probably do that a lot, right? So let's see how many people will join. All right, so lots of people are entering. I'm going to wait until we get to, let's say, 50 people, and then I'm going to get started. And you can join later if you want. We've only got two or three more minutes, but I think that's about uh, the time we need. We're going to be okay. Lots of players coming in. All right, congratulations, guy. I can see some people from Book joining. <laughs> All right, most people are joining right now, so I'm not going to... All right, I think it's like a popcorn. When it stops popping, it's probably time to get the bag out of the microwave. So let's get the bag out of the microwave right now, when we reach 100. Okay, here we go. So we're going to start, and you can still join us, okay? So here we have the first question. I hope you have time enough to answer. It's only seven questions. Tools that allow teachers to register their students and assign work are called what? What do you call those tools, those platforms? They are platforms like Google Classroom, which allows students, or My English Lab, for example, from Pearson. What do you call these tools? Are they student information system, <laughs> data management system, content management system, or learner, learning management system? Lots of answers. Let's see. Oh, no more time. Time is over. Most people got it right. Learning management systems are those tools that allow you to register students and assign content to them. Uh, let's see who's going to win this. Okay, guys. The overlapping of virtual information in real world is known as, and you can guess, no problem. You can use Kahoot to, 
teach your students as well if they don't know uh, of a topic. So uh, overlapping of virtual information in real world is called, is it augmented reality or virtual reality? Or is it blended reality? Oh my gosh, I'm confused now. Okay, most people are answering right now. Okay, thank you. More than 100 answers, very nice. Augmented reality, guys. In uh, virtual information in the real world, augmented reality. In virtual reality, everything is virtual, right? In augmented reality, um, it's in real world, but the information are virtual. Uh, next, let's go. Okay, we have a new leader. All right, try to be fast. The trend in which students learn by uh, putting their hands to work is called, and what is it called? Okay, some people are answering here already. Constructionism, because they construct things. Art, personalized learning, or maker movement. Let's see. Again, more than 100 answers. All right, thank you. So here we go, it's the maker, it's the maker movement, congrats, it's not constructionism, right, um, in a way. So we have a new leader again, people are going neck and neck. Where people, especially under 30 years old, go to learn how to do something? Where do they go? Do they go to the library? Do they go to Wikipedia? Do they go to Google or do they go to YouTube? What do you think? especially if you're under 30, to learn how to do, yeah? yeah? Notice that I mentioned learn how to do. It might be cook something or to repair something that's broken. Where do you go? You go to Google. And if you're under 30, where do you go? You probably go to YouTube with Google coming second, right? So in this case, both are probably high um, in, in your evaluation. But yeah, so... YouTube first and Google second. Which of these elements is not considered an aspect of gamification? And we have only two more questions and we'll be done. Um, not a considered of gamification. Formative assessment, play to win, fun learning or motivation. Which of these is not an aspect of gamification in education? What do you think? All right, more than 100 answers again. So I guess it's time to check your answers. You are not there to play to win, guys. A formative assessment is part of gamification. Gamification helps with formative assessment. That's what I meant. Uh, but you're not there to play to win. You're going to play, and if you win, fine. Yana is the leader. I think I know Yana. Oh, in this, you can select as many as you want. Due to the technological transformation, which of these resources are important for your teaching, yourself. You can choose all that are important for you, okay, guys? More than one answer is possible here. Right? And there you go. Thank you so much. Now, um, last but not least, the most frequent reason for educators not to use mobile devices in class is why don't they use mobile devices in class in your opinion there is no right or wrong it's simply your opinion i would like to to have again thank you so much we really value your your feedback your participation and the winner is according to yourselves how to man oh <laughs> I chose the right. I said there was no wrong answer, but no, all of them should be considered. 41 of you think it's because of they are afraid of distractions. They lack abilities. They use better tools for motivation. And But most, I mean, I made a mistake on this one and I'm sorry. But anyway, the podium for Education 4.0 uh, quiz is Jade number Three, the third place. Yana came in second. And the winner is 
Chan, 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 chan. Amy, congratulations, Amy. So with this, guys, with this uh, little piece of uh, quiz, I say goodbye to you. I would love to have some time for Q&A, for questions and answers and feedback. But uh, conclusion of this all that we talked about is that the pandemic accelerated technolog technological shift which was uh, predicted for the next decade. That implies we have students connected all the time right now. If uh, you were afraid of having students in a cell phone, nowadays they may need the cell phone to study. Electronic devices are closer and closer to students and there is a need for uh, material that offers resources compatible to the new normal. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Barbara, who will close this. And if you have any questions, if you want to contact me, this is my email address. Thank you so much.